Hey everybody, this is Hercules Pedics, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Hercules Pedics Academy of Comic Book Studies. Today, we're going to be looking at Raw, Volume 2, Number 1, from 1989. Uh, Raw's, no offense to the fine creators of Epic Illustrated, but Raw is definitely one of the best anthologies ever made. Um, they started in 1980. Uh, Art Spiegelman and Francois Mouly created and published eight issues of it throughout the 80s. Um, the original Raws were like huge. They were like 11 by 17 or maybe even bigger. And I only have like three of them of the original issues, maybe four. I don't have a complete run. But, and they're also so big, it kind of it's kind of hard to show them off. You know, I probably need a better camera. Um, but... Uh, I guess a few years after Art Spiegelman put out uh, volume one of Mouse, the graphic novel, comics kind of had a cachet that they never had before. Uh, graphic novels did. So a lot of uh, big publishers, real book publishers, start sniffing around. And luckily because of that, Penguin Books published three issues of this Raw, starting in 1989. And they're nice and fat, as you can see. And so... They're just amazing. Oh, probably Raw 1 through 3, these second um, second volume. Probably three of the best comics ever made. Like, if you had to take three comics to a desert island, they're so good and amazing stuff. Um, they always have a subtitle. This one is Open Wounds from the Cutting Edge of Comics. And they just got some of the best comic creators in the world to be in this. Beautiful cover by Gary Panner. Nice homage to comics history. You know, you got Nancy, Popeye, and Donald Duck all smushed together in some beautiful primitive painting. Inside front cover by Ever Mullen, another frequent, frequent raw contributor. Ever Mullen is from uh, Belgium. And... He's got a really weird style, as you can see, where it's almost like all rules of perspective and basically all art rules are thrown out the window. And he has this weird flat style where things just kind of bleed into each other. And this stuff's always very fun. Just uh, he always packs everything with some sight gags and little chicken fat things to look at. Kind of fun, breezy style. Beautiful, beautifully designed book. I just love the contents page even. It just looks great. It's uh, designed by Art Spiegelman and Francois Mouly, who are the editors as well. Arsa Koryak is the associate editor. And uh, <coughs> let's see all the delights within. Man, what a way to start out. Charles Burns, Teen Plague. This is basically the prequel to uh, Charles Burns' amazing graphic novel, Black Hole. Well, it was a comic, but of course it was meant to be a collection. Beautiful prime Charles Burns. Well, it's not like he ever left his prime. I mean, he's just one of the best cartoonists ever. Almost every page he's ever drawn is flawless. And But this is just so good. It's beautiful stuff. So it's a big baby story, basically. Tony Del Monto, Charles Burns' running character. Just love this guy. His face just makes me laugh. <laughs> just a very funny character. Excuse me, I need some water. Still kind of getting over my cold, people. Sorry about that. <coughs> so, uh, it, Big Baby um smuggles this horror comic into his bedroom. His parents aren't down with stuff like this. Look at that great cover. I wish I had this comic. I wish it was real. He starts reading it. It's basically about uh, this alien named Kabbalah Banga who crash lands on Earth and implements a plan to take over the whole planet. He's got this weird, like, segmented, disgusting, repulsive tongue. And he grabs this teenage girl. And he, he kisses her on the neck with it. And it leaves this little mark on her neck. And now she's going to be his slave. 
So right then the parents say, Tony, get down here. We're leaving. The babysitter's here. And it's uh, his best friend, Sam. It's his old, her, sorry, Sam's older sister, Joyce. She's the babysitter. And she's got a hickey on her neck. And of course, Tony is just like, look, you've got the mark of Kabbalah Bunga on your neck. And of course, the parents are like, Tony, don't be rude. And the teenage girl's kind of mortified. She's like, oh, I just saw my hickey. So after the parents leave, she calls her boyfriend and is like, you're going to come over later, right? After I put him to bed. And she puts him to bed. Tony's under the covers with his flashlight. Continues the comic book story. So uh, that girl is now part of Kabbalah Bangi. Sorry, Kabbalah Banga slave army. And these uh, other teenagers pick her up on the side of the road. And she gives uh, this single dude the kiss of Kabbalah Banga. That's an amazing panel there. Just photorealistic. Uh, Charles Burns just found an old movie still. I think this is from I Was a Teenage Werewolf. And uh, the the couple in the front of the car, they look back and, uh, you know, their friend is infected. And look at this horrifying sequence of panels. He becomes one of the Kabbalah Bangas. And then they attack the, the other couple. Man, amazing art. So meanwhile, back in reality... Uh, Joyce's boyfriend comes over, Jeff. And Jeff is not looking good. He's sweaty. He looks pale. He's not feeling good. And he's kind of um, mentally not well. He tells Joyce about this recurring nightmare he's been having where he's in school and the ceilings turn all fleshy and start spilling blood into the classroom. And when he looks at his classmates, they just look like horrible monstrosities, you know, nightmare visions. And then the room, classroom fills up with blood and they all drown. God, that's, I'm glad I don't have nightmares like that. So she's just like, oh, calm down, honey. It'll be okay. And she kind of like reaches under his shirt. She wants to make out or something. And it's, she... She has blood on her hands. And he says, oh, let me show you. And he's got this weird looking rash on his stomach. If you've read Black Hole and the other Teen Plague stories, you'll see, know that that's the shape it always makes. It's a very distinctive rash it leaves. And then Tony comes downstairs and says, hey, you better watch out. She's gonna give you the kiss of Kabbalah Banga and you're gonna turn into one of those giant eyeballs. Tony's such a goon. Next day in class, Tony's reading his comic book. He's got it tucked into his biology book. So the teacher's none the wiser. And we see that the Kabbalah Banga is spreading. And they attack a party full of teenagers. So there's even more of them. God, I wish this was a real comic. <laughs> like, I wish they would publish this on newsprint paper. With a nice color cover so then we see in a spaceship orbiting earth we see uh, one of Kabbalah Banga's race and they're not all bad it's just Kabbalah Banga he's like a criminal on this planet and they've captured him and they they want to make right you know his wrong so they see that Kabbalah Banga's infected this house full of teenagers and they destroy it they just laser blast them into fiery death. And they're like, we regret having to take these innocent lives, but it was for the best of the planet. By destroying these few humans, we've saved an entire species from insanity. But then we see, meanwhile, one of them has survived. This woman, and she goes, Kabbalah Banga! The end. Right there, the teacher grabs the comic and is like, Tony, I'm very disappointed in you. So Tony is convinced that 
this is all real. This comic isn't just a story. So him and Sam, his best friend, are walking home. He says, oh, Sam, let's go to your house and uh, check out your sister's bedroom. Maybe we'll find evidence. Because if you remember, uh, his older sister is the babysitter. He's reading her diary in which she reveals that she gave up her virginity to Jeff. And she's totally in love with him. Joyce comes home and Tony is just like, don't let her get too close. She might give you the Kabbalah Banga kiss. She just ignores them. She's like packing her stuff. And she says, I'm leaving. I don't belong here anymore. I'm leaving to be with the man I love. She packs a little suitcase, goes out to the car. Back in the house, they hear a knock at the door. And Sam answers the door. It's this guy in a hazmat suit. He's like, we're from the disease control squad. We're trying to locate Joyce Sobolowski, his sister. And Sam says they just left. She just left with her boyfriend, Jeff. A few hours later, um, Joyce is driving Jeff and he's looking terrible. Look at him. The rash is all the way up to his eyeballs. He's kind of hallucinating. He's kind of feverish. She's so in love. She's just like, I'll get a job somewhere and take care of us and I'll support us until you get better. And he's getting more and more you know, hallucinating. And he sees her as this monster. The He sees blood pouring from the ceiling of the car. And then he wigs out and causes the car to crash. They land in this, uh, in a lake. So some body of water. And he's just totally just lost in his nightmare. As the water's pouring into the car, all he sees is his nightmare vision of blood pouring out of the ceiling. She rescues him, pulls him out of the lake. And he tells her about, you know, the teen plague. So there is this teen plague that is spreading. And he reveals that, uh, you know, he slept with this girl. That's how he got it. Because it's a venereal disease. You can only get it by having sex. And a policeman shows up and offers assistance. And when he shines the flashlight on her, he says, what's that stuff? And it looks like the rash is on her legs. She's got the teen plague. Later at the Del Monte residence, Tony's house, Sam and Tony are reading the paper. Two cases of teen plague reported at local high school. And, uh, They'll probably never see them again. Tony is still convinced it's Kabbalah Banga and that the newspaper is just covering up the real, the real story. And then the mom pokes in her head and says, your babysitter's going to be here soon, Tony. And he's like, oh, babysitter? The end. Great stuff. All right, Spiegelman does a one-pager, Dead Dick. This is a very... uh kind of arty, surreal comic, very experimental. And it's kind of like a, not an homage, but it's inspired by Dick Tracy. But then it turns it into this totally like, I don't know, kind of poetic, weird uh, art strip. The gun screams fire, sadness dances a liquid tango, dead, dead, dead. Millions gone, yet still you laugh. Float to inky ruin. I don't know what it means, but I like it a lot. It's really fun stuff. That logo alone is amazing. Amazing graphics. The Crime Stoppers Handbook from Dick Tracy. They've got little, you know, parodies of it. Christ Stabber's Taste Box. Cream Spinach Taxi Cab. Oh, here we got the great underground cartoonist, Justin Green, um, creator of Binky Brown. A Shaggy Ant story. And this is um, an autobio comic. Uh, Justin Green uh, is with his wife and kid. He's got this little art studio. And one day the ants get into his uh, sugar can. 
He's got a big can of sugar for his coffee. He throws it out the door in anger, and it lands in the backyard. Weeks later, he notices that it's become this huge, um, basically, ant colony. And he's kind of fascinated by watching the ants. It's like having his own ant farm. But then he has a flashback to his childhood, and he was very cruel to ants as a child. He'd stomp them by the hundreds. And uh, so it's almost like he wants to rectify that. So he almost, he builds the ants their own nice little home. He puts it up on blocks, the can, puts a little uh, roller pin over it to protect it from the rain. And he's very proud of his, the benevolent use of his power. It gives him a thrill. So he's fascinated by this ant farm, how it's progressing. But then one day he notices that uh, all the ants are like barely moving. They're all sluggish. Um, they don't seem to be working anymore. And he realizes that he's created a decadent civilization. So he finally decides to cut open the can. He's like, I want to see what the hell's going on in there. And just what he feared, it's, it's just complete chaos in the ant farm. And as soon as he opens the can, they all try to just like slowly escape. They, they realize it's no good for him. Meanwhile, this guy's turning off his power and it turns out the whole building's been condemned. He didn't even know. So he's gonna lose his studio. And uh, just as he has to, he's forced from his space. He leaves at night so he can skip paying rent. <laughs> and then the ants were forced from their space into the light of day. I love that little story. It's such a weird little parable. Here we have the great Drew Friedman. And this is, I don't know if this has ever been replicated, but Mark Newgarden does the script for him. I don't think those guys collaborate often. This is called Reds. It's based on this famous bootleg audio cassette that was really popular in the 80s. People would, you know, trade tapes back then before the internet. And there was a famous one where this guy used to call up this bar and this cranky old man was the bartender and owner. And he would do prank, prank calls to this bar almost every day. And the bar, bartender, Red, would get so angry and curse the guy out that it was kind of funny. He always fell for the bait. It's not like he just got over and said, ah, oh, goddamn guy. He'd just start screaming at him. So we see, though, this legendary character, Red, we see what his normal day is like. And he's just a sad old man, a sad, lonely old man who really does nothing, does some laundry, sits in the park and just watches happy people. And when he goes to work, just like almost every day, we see that prank caller and Red loses it once again. Why you filthy, no good cocksucker, you stupid, jealous son of a bitch. Why don't you come down here? And the guy hangs up. And then we realize that this prank caller is kind of just as sad and lonely as Red. <laughs> he just has this pretty sad life. It's kind of sad. It's almost like they should meet and become friends <laughs> instead of doing this all the time. They'd probably get along. There's a great little short film made of the whole Red thing, and Lawrence Tierney's in it from Reservoir Dogs. That kind of looks like him, huh? But, um, yeah. Funny tapes, if you've ever heard them. So here we have Joost Swarta, the great Netherlands cartoonist, the girly family. And it's just this weird gag strip where all these women use male pronouns. I know that sounds uh, <laughs> weird in today's, you know, from today's society. But this is just, it's played for comic effect. And it is kind of funny. I can't really describe it without reading the whole strip. But look at Juice Swartz, beautiful. I just love his clear line style. It's, it's one of the most appealing comic styles, I think, in all of cartooning. Just so nice. Juice Swartz is like, he's like a um, treasure in his country. Like, he's designed stamps for the government, official postal stamps, and done public murals for government buildings and shit. He's really famous there. I don't even think he does comics anymore. He's too, you know, too big for that. Here we have a great one-pager from Kaz, a very, like, 
it's not like his underworld stuff, his later strip. It's not, it's not like a gag. It's this very arty, surreal uh, comic, fully painted, very primitive art style. And I love the concept of this is there's this movie theater where every p- patron gets his own private movie projector and film. As the lights dim, everyone turns their projector on at once and aims it at the screen. And as you can imagine, it turns into this, whatever, psychedelic phantasmagoria of images bleeding into each other and stuff. The narrator says, my eyeballs turn to jelly and bled. (laughs) I just love this one. I just love the idea of that. I would actually want to go to that theater and try that. Uh, The great Mark Beyer, frequent rock contributor, um, Raw even put out his first book, uh, Amy and Jordan, his uh, long-running characters. This one's called The Glass Thief. I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you, the cast story is called Poop Deck Misto Cinema. But back to The uh, Glass Thief, this features Amy and Jordan. And uh, if you've ever read Mark Beyer, his stuff is really bleak. Uh, bleak might not even be strong enough a word. It's <laughs> It's really just nihilistically horrible. But also hilarious. Somehow it's funny as hell, even though all the things that are happening to the characters are terrible. So here's a perfect example. Jordan owns a pet shop. One day all the animals, he he shows up, all the animals have committed suicide. We see all these cats and dogs and nooses. So he burns all the corpses at this junkyard. When he tell comes home to tell Amy what happened, she says... I don't think it was suicide, Jordan. I think it was murder. We got to capture the the culprit. And uh, they figure he's going to return to the scene of the crime, whoever did it. And they conk this guy in the head who shows up. As you can see, if you're not familiar with Mark Byers' work, very primitive, almost childlike. Very Rory Hayes, um, the the great underground cartoonist. I mean, I know that Mark Beyer was probably in love with Rory Hayes when he discovered his work. Very, it has that amazing childlike thing to it, but it's horrifying. I, like, you wouldn't want children to read these, but... So they eventually, uh, they prove that the guy's the murderer. He's got all these animal corpses in his house, and they shoot him to death. Oh, next we got a Cowboy Hank comic from Kamagurka and Seal (coughs) from Finland, I believe. One of those blonde countries. And uh, if you've never read Cowboy Hank, just uh, amazing gag strips, but they're like surreal Dada gag strips. They're just amazing. There's this one's a very this one's even more Dada and surreal than normal, but it's great. Good stuff. Arsa Koryak colors this. Next we have With Margaret Neely as Peg, a short story by Tom DeHaven. Uh, Tom DeHaven, uh, we've looked at before on the channel. Uh, his novel, Freaks the Amour, was adapted to a four issue, three issue miniseries in the 80s or 90s. And his novels, he's written a bunch of novels about comics, strip history, and comic book history. So, uh, he's, I think he's in a few Ross, his stuff. Roy used to always like to have at least one text piece in an issue, either a short story or an article about some crazy hip thing, you know? Nice little story. It's about this typical, uh, June Cleaver fifties woman who happened to have fallen in love and married a guy who seemingly was an all American guy. Turns out to be a communist spy helping out Russia. But she just goes through life like June Cleaver, kind of annoyed that her husband can't be like normal guys and go to the Rotary Club. But she puts up with it. She's just like, oh, my husband's such a pain in the ass with his ham radio sending secrets to Russia. I really like this. The design is by Francois Mouly. And she found all these great Red Scare images from the 50s. These are trading cards of communist dictators I, I want to see more of these look how great that art is a 50s movie called The Red Menace uh, exploitation novel 70s 
soft core, probably bondage type thing, red rape. I married a communist. More trading cards for children to fight the red menace. Anti-communist comic books. Oh, this is nice. The The Big Mouth and the Big Ears by Boris Artsy Bashev. And uh, <clears throat> if you're not familiar with Boris Artsy Bashev, uh, you should make yourself familiar with him. He's an amazing artist. He drew like all these great time covers. He was a huge commercial artist, but he also did these weirder cartoons. And this is a anti-communist cartoon, as you can probably see. But this always has a, what's the word? Um, this resonance in my head, this image. Because right around this time, my band, my punk band at the time, put out a cassette album. And I just stole this to be the cover because it's such a great image. So every time I see this, you know, I'm just like, oh, there's my cassette. There's my album. Yeah, great images, great uh, imagery. And it's a really good story. Tom Damon's a great writer. Here we have David Holzman. It's called Wild Heart. And I guess David Holzman kind of, all of his comics were kind of like Franz Mazarell, Lynn Ward comics. They're, you know, like those woodcut graphic novelists from the 30s. They're, re they're silent, and he uses that woodcut style. This one's a very you know, like surreal dream-like story. We see this woman in a pretty unhappy-looking marriage. It looks like she just serves her husband, and he's just not appreciative of her. She has a dream one night, <clears throat> and it's really just this crazy dream. Um, they're pulled over by the side of the road, her and her husband, by these Aztec-looking guys who rip into his chest, cut into his chest, and pull his heart out. She um, goes on like almost like the psychedelic journey, crazy vision quest. She sees a giant wicker man. This dinosaur attacks her. She gets bitten by this rattlesnake and then almost becomes like a demigod. All these powers. I love that image right there. Like very Native American looking. And then she attack, kills the dinosaur, rips the dinosaur's heart out. And she puts it in her husband's chest. Who it, and it brings him back to life. And then for some reason, all of a sudden, he's in this monkey suit, gorilla suit. He kills the rattlesnake and gives it to his wife, and they walk off happy. The woman wakes up, and it looks like the husband is in that monkey suit from her dream, and everything's different now. He's very attentive and devoted and loving. He's even down on his knees praying to her at one point. And that's the end of the story. I don't know. I'm not sure what it means, but it's a great story. Great little uh, interesting dream-like story. Here we have uh, one of R. Sikoryak's earliest, um, you know, uh, comic book parodies, adapt, you know, for adapting literature or vice versa. And uh, it's... Um, it's Dante's Inferno in the style of Bazooka Joe comics from the gum. Inferno Joe and his guide. And uh, I'm sorry, it's just Inferno Joe. And using the Bazooka Joe, the gag format, obviously very abridged version of Dante's Inferno. Um, he kind of tells the story of Dante's Inferno just doing dumb Bazooka Joe gags. <laughs> We see the misers and the squanderers. Why didn't you hoard? Why didn't you waste? Excuse me. Why didn't you repent? <laughs> I mean, they're so dumb, but kind of funny. The little um, trinkets that you could send away with three wrappers and some money. They all have, you know, have something to do with Dante's Inferno. Roadmap of Hell. Franciscan Rope. Just very clever, like... He obviously put a lot of thought into these. And uh, I think this is one of his first ones. Really nice. Ah, uh, here we have the great underground cartoonist, uh, Kim Deitch, uh, one of the great storytellers of comic history. Carla in Commie Land. This is kind of a nice companion piece to that uh, Marge Neely as Peg. 
short story. So Carla one day is watching her favorite cartoon show, the Junior Frolics show. And then all of a sudden, it's uh, preempted by the McCarthy hearings. And her mother says, run along. It's enough of your cartoons. I got to watch this. Her uh, husband, The father comes home. And they both sound like they're not into McCarthy. They think he's a bastard. And they're glad that he's finally getting his. The daughter's in it still pissed off because she, uh, she can't watch her cartoons. So the mother sends her up to her room and she yells at the parents, dirty communists. Instead of going to her, her room, she goes to the attic and kicks over a box, finds the little Lenin library. Like there's like 10 volumes of it. Apparently, this is a real thing. Uh, Kim Deitch admits later on that there really was a little Lenin library to teach little kids about socialism. So, she hears a commotion and looks through the keyhole. And she sees that all the cartoon characters from her favorite show are injecting zombie juice into her parents' heads. She runs downstairs, but it's too late. It looks like the whole neighborhood has been infected with zombie juice. In fact, each one has a little cartoon character on their shoulder with a hypo. Up in the attic, they're all being indoctrinated into communist propaganda, with communist propaganda. All the cartoon characters are commies. So Carla runs downstairs and calls Senator Joe McCarthy and says, here's my address, come here quick. And the animals rush into the room. They about to give her zombie juice. <coughs> Excuse me. And then Joe McCarthy runs in with some army commandos. <laughs> and they just exterminate all the cartoon, the commie cartoon characters. It's pretty gory. And they rescue Carla. He gives her a medal for being such a good as American. Says that everything will go back to normal once the zombie juice wears off. Carla wakes up. She's got the medal on her shirt, so maybe it wasn't a dream. And then we see a little uh, epilogue, Little Kimbo in Pinko Land. And Kim Dice has a little autobio about his upbringing. And his parents were, you know, not full on communist, but they were very left wing. And he hated it. He just wanted his parents to be normal. But, you know, they, his dad played the bongos. They had weird modern art on the walls. And, uh, his friends would come over to play banjos, play old folk, you know, union songs and stuff. Man, this is some nice cartooning. I love that. Look at that great logo there. That is an amazing font. I would buy that font. Oh, this story is kind of, kind of became legendary. Richard McGuire has, hasn't done much in comics uh, for decades. But he did this comic called Here. And... This whole comic plays with time and space, where we see 1957, this couple in this house. The woman's about to give birth. Obviously, it's a little later. He says, yay, he weighs 10 pounds, 6 ounces. A little later, the lady's holding the baby in her lap on the sofa. And then we start playing around with time. The panel around her is 1922. The people who used to live in this house. Then we jump ahead to 1971. There's this kind of hip woman dressed in that fashion from that time. And I don't know if that's the, that little baby grown up. And then meanwhile, we see a cat from 1999 walk across the room. So he just keeps jumping through time. 1940, Happy New Year. And he starts segment, segmenting it more and more. And then he starts doing really crazy stuff. We see a, a mule and some cows, 1860, because this house wasn't even there yet. Yet That was a grazing land. We see 2029, there's a fire. 
1971, a glass of water is falling. Just like little things, big things. 1902, the house is being built. I like things like this. We see a tree in 1902. 1869, a little subset panel. It's a little sapling. Yeah, this comic is... You could reread it a lot. It definitely um, rewards you with uh, multiple readings. 1964, kid's getting his picture taken. 1974, he's graduating, getting his picture taken. 1984, he's a middle-aged man getting his picture taken in the same house. We see another glimpse before the house was built, 1870. So it just goes on like that. I mean, I, I imagine this guy must have had like a dry erase board with hundreds of things like how to plan this all out. I love this. 100 million BC, and we see the Stegosaurus. That's, I guess, where the house would be. 2027, we see that guy from the, who was born in the 50s. He's an old man just checking out his old place. He's like, it's been 30 years since I've seen this place. And this woman's wearing this crazy modern fashion. Seventeen fifty, we see teepees. <laughs> Five hundred billion years ago, it's just magma. When the Earth was just forming, man, it's such a good story. Yeah, this story kind of became just this like legendary thing, because nobody had ever done anything like this before, and it's it seems like obviously a guy like Chris Ware probably read this and was influenced by it. Um, other artists, uh, thinking, smart cartoonists, you know. Um, it, decades later, he expanded this into a graphic novel. And I don't know if it's any good. I've never read it. It did seem kind of sad to me that this guy, he's just like for decades was like, oh, this is the only good thing I've ever done that made a mark. So I'm going to expand it into a graphic novel. I know that's negative thinking, but that's what I kind of imagined. But I don't know. Maybe it's great. I definitely want to read it one day. Oh, man, this story is hardcore. Is Jacques Lousteau, uh, script by Villard, Villard. And, uh, you know, Jack, Jack Lousteau did all those great graphic no novels for Catalan Communications in the 80s, like Barney and the Blue Note and a bunch of other ones. Amazing French cartoonist. Um, this story is crazy. It's narrated by this husband. And one day his wife just starts eating and eating and eating. And within just a couple of months, she gains like 100 pounds. It's almost like she's bulimic, even though she doesn't puke it up. And he's not, he doesn't know, you know, what's going on. He asked some of the smart people in town that he knows from the bar, like there's a professor in town. And uh, he says, maybe she's trying to compensate for something, to forget something, or to punish herself for something. The husband's kind of embarrassed of his wife. People at church kind of now avoid them. They're friends. I guess she's an embarrassment to everyone because she's fat. One day he sees her on a piece of uh, sitting, just staring quietly. And he realizes, he remembers, it's right near where their barn used to be. They had a barn that burned down a long time ago. While the wife was uh, getting pails of water, she said, Raymond, the twins are sleeping in the barn up, upstairs because it's a hot night. Go get them. I'll, I'll get, get buckets of water. While she's busy doing that, she doesn't even realize. He, he, he saves his car. He pushes his car out of the barn. And... Because it's a new car that he loves. When he comes back, he finds Mona in the hayloft. <coughs> What's those piles of rags? That's the kids, Raymond. And he tells her, don't worry, we'll make some more. He actually rationalizes it, saying that kids come and go. You can always make more kids, but you can't make another car. So this guy let his kids die and he doesn't even feel bad about it. So that's what Mona's been sublimating for all this time. 
and trying to forget. And then that's why she started eating all of a sudden. And he tells the, um, he realizes that that's why she's sitting there. And he says, come on, Mona. You wouldn't have wanted me to fetch the kids out before the car, would you? Still has no regret about his decision. God, that's amazing. And so he realizes, he stops picking on her, on her eating habits. He says... It's no picnic living with a 200 pound blimp, but hey, I treat her like a princess. And she buys it, the dumb bitch. <laughs> As if the whole thing wasn't harsh enough. Just like, just seeing inside this guy's brain. This guy has probably never committed a crime. Ever, you know, he's just a normal citizen, but he's a fucking monster. It's just like, oh, what a bleak story. Just makes you want to like, call down the nuclear bombs to just kill us all or to have the glaciers melt. <laughs> it's like we don't deserve to exist as a species. Humans are terrible. Here we have Christine Critter, the great, uh, I think she was from the Bay Area. Um, she's a great cartoonist uh, pretty much throughout the 80s. She was in tons of anthologies. And she always drew in this like funny animal style but very belabored, disturbing um, very emotional. Her characters, when they wig out, almost like Peter Bagg's characters, they wig out. It's just like, she's really good at capturing, like, hyperkinetic states. Spasticness, if you will. And uh, this guy shows up distraught, hysterical at his friend's house. And through pictograms, there's no words in this, we see that all of his friends have committed suicide. So he's, this character's totally depressed. The friend talks him down and they actually, he ends up leaving smiling and they're like, I love you, thanks. But then thinking about those suicides, now the friend is getting depressed. And so they kill themselves, they hang themselves. The character, the, the first guy realizes he left his hat at the house, so he returns to the apartment, and he sees his dead friend who's committed suicide. Once again, he's all, ah, wig it out. You probably can't even see how detailed this is, because the camera, I'm sorry, but this is just amazing, crazy art. <laughs> Look at that face. So then he goes to another friend's house and starts his litany, now with a fourth suicide. Ah, everyone I know is killing themselves. And it's just going to keep going, I guess, you know. Here we have another cowboy Hank from Kamagurka and Seal. He's eating this plate of spaghetti, and it just won't end. And it actually goes through the plate, so he keeps slurping it. He follows it out the door, down the street. And the the cord ends in this in between this woman's legs. Congratulations, madam. It's a son. <laughs> that's like, that's the cowboy Hank. That's the sense of humor. So here's a next story by Pascal Dory. Let me double check. I think he's French. Yes, he is French. This one's a sideways thing. I hope you can see it okay. And this is so disturbing, this artist. Just draws in this crazy very hatched style, very belabored. And it's just about this little boy and nothing that happens to him is that bad in the comic, but the way Pascal Dory draws, it looks so nightmarish. Everything looks like it's a bad dream. Oh, sorry, gotta pull that down. See, look at this. I don't know what the hell's going on in this picture, but it just, something with all these lines, it's almost like speed lines that are caught in a hurricane. Like this, oh, I'm sorry. The speed lines don't quite work as speed lines, but it just gives it the sense of furious uh, agitation. I, I can't think of the word, but it's very horrifying to me. 
very frightening. Something not good is happening, and I don't know what it is. That's what a lot of these drawings are. It's like, this doesn't look good. Like this one, look at this amazing perspective going on. All these toys flying out at the viewer. He's in boarding school. I don't know what these students are doing, but they look horrifying. They're nightmare visions. Oh man, so creepy. Paul sees his classmates fight. And look at that capturing just the furious intensity of like a f actual fight, but even more so. I mean, this is almost like the Tasmani Tasmanian devils are in a fight. God, just disturbing stuff. I think I've only seen this guy in Raw, Pascal Dory. Paul prefers his mommy to the love of a girl. Doesn't look like he's too happy there. Disturbing as hell. Those look like jack o' lanterns, but way scarier. Paul at the cafeteria? I don't know what the hell's going on, but it doesn't look pleasant. Paul plays war every two weeks. Paul goes home to mommy. This is the kind of artwork where it just seems like this guy must be kind of insane. Even though he's probably just the happiest camper. You know, just like uh, Genji Ito. They say Genji Ito is this totally happy-go-lucky, friendly guy. And, uh, but still, this just seems like, this is disturbing stuff. This is like outsider art, you know? Way more accomplished, though. Amazing skill and dexterity. But just in, it's like really like what in, this is what a, probably reality seems like if you're schizophrenic. Paul goes back to school. Paul on the bus. And school starts again. And it looks like the nightmares are starting again. Mm, excuse me a second. Oh, here we have the great artist Lorenzo Matotti with a script by Kramsky. Let me see his full name. Oh, I guess it's just Kramsky. He's a Italian artist, Matotti. Uh, did a lot of like classic graphic novels uh, published by Catalan Communications once again in the 80s. Um, Fires, that's one of his famous uh, graphic novels. I think this guy's won the the Angelum, you know, comic awards, like three times or more. Just a, a really beloved European cartoonist. This one's kind of a weird story. Just about this guy named Zephyr, who's just kind of like a dreamer. I don't know, kind of a crazy person. And it's just his musings, his philosophical musings. And I guess he doesn't have to work. And he inherited, inherited this apartment from his uncle. So he just walks around all day thinking weird thoughts, basically. 
He's always chasing birds out of his apartment for some reason. They're, birds like his place. And he just goes walking around this beautifully painted backdrop, the city. It's almost like without the hat, he's wearing the shadows outfit, the old pulp hero. We see these guys on a balcony talking about him, kind of making fun of him. What gibberish that rat face sprouts. And it is kind of gibberish. The guy just walks around spouting this nonsense. He climbs up to this giant, I think it's like a gas tank. And he draws in his little sketchbook. Man, he's such a good designer. Like all of his panels and the pages themselves as a unit all just look so great. Beautiful painting. And this woman who works at the this gas works says, hey, come down from there. You know this is dangerous. It seems like he's totally in love with her. So much so that he has to flee. He's like, ah. He, he has a panic attack. And he goes home <clears throat> and looks at the gas works. A painting falls, while he's asleep, a painting falls from over his bed and it reveals a window he never even realized was there. And he describes a dream he had. So it's just very nonsensical, but man, just beautiful artwork. Here we have chapter eight of Mouse. Uh, this is Mauschewitz, Time Flies. This would be collected in volume two of Mouse, which hadn't come out yet, the collection. So he was still serializing Mouse in Raw. He gives us a nice recap. He even like uh, reprints all of chapter seven, which was in the last issue of the first volume of Raw. You're very tiny, but you can read it. So it's nice. You can totally get caught up to snuff. Because rightfully so, most people probably in America had bought Raw number eight. I think they only made like 10,000 of them. We have an ad for Mouse here. Okay, so now I'm not gonna go over the whole comic. It's Mouse, you know, maybe one day I'll do a three hour video on Mouse, but I think um, that's not necessary. Enough people have talked about Mouse. Suffice to say, it is, it, it's deserving of being one of the best graphic novels of all time and that's how great raw was not only did we already look at all this great comics but raw would have the latest chapter meaty chapter of <laughs> mouse one of the greatest graphic novels of all time so i mean that's this is what i'm talking about when i said that raw's the best anthology ever and even each solitary issue is like one of the best comics you could ever read because at the time, this was all new. Getting to read a 30-page like, chapter of Mouse, that alone is worth five times the price of admission, you know? Yeah, I'm sure... I, ho I hope everyone watching this video has read Mouse. <laughs> it's really... You know, there's some things like people say, oh, this is the best, you gotta, you gotta read Moby Dick. Or you gotta hear Sgt. Pepper's. A lot of times you're like, yeah, it's not so great. This is really as great as uh, it's been made to be. Yeah, 34 pages of mouse. It's nice. <coughs> Excuse me. So here we have Mariscal. I think that's his only name. <clears throat> and the, the Bariris in Rough Sea. These were these characters that Mariscal would always draw. These are such weird little comics. I mean, he was like one of the most famous French cartoonists. And his stuff wouldn't appear in kids' comics, but they are total kids' comics. Very, like, primitively drawn, but with this really appealing style. This just fun, cutesy style. And, like, for example, they have strips on the bottom of each page. This one is just their heads ducking up below and above the horizon line. So we just do weird things like that. I totally can imagine that like uh, Patrick McDonald from Mutt's fame 
read these and like these because it's so simple. The other, it's almost like pictograms, like hieroglyphics, the characters, but they're awfully cute. <laughs> and really, there's n not much happens in these comics except like the little kid comics. They, it's a rough day on the ocean. So they decide to take care of all the fish and throw medicine and antihistamines and, and Alka-Seltzer and Dramamine into the ocean to help the fish. This is zany. Even the, um, the vocabulary is at a very, you know, simple level. Just zany antics. Is it octopus? They go out to rescue the octopus. And uh, luckily the ocean calms and they make it home. <laughs> the octopus and a... They keep calling it a shrimp, but it looks like a lobster. I don't know if that was the translator's fault. I like this gag where they're drinking champagne to excess. And uh, one of them says, hey, Piker, and he vomits. No more hiccups. I guess that would cure the hiccups if you were sick. Oh, yeah, the characters are named Furman and Piker, and their dog's name is Julian. And there's a bunch of these strips. I think I've seen one other, maybe in Raw. Yeah, I've probably only seen this guy in Raw. But just a really odd cartoonist. Like, I mean, just like how beautiful the colors are. And the simple shapes, just beautifully designed. But really, it is just a really, like a comic a four-year-old would write. Yeah, in this one, they get all the fish high. They give them drugs. I just love this beautiful fucking strip. Look at the colors on that and the design. It's just the main characters looking at the moonrise. <laughs> and that's it. They're just sitting on rocks looking at the moonrise. This is a nice autobiotype comic uh, by Baru. I think Baru is French. Let me double check. Yes. And I guess he just has one name, Baru. And he's just talking about when he was a kid. He used to go to the public baths. I guess nobody had bathrooms back then for themselves. So you'd have to shower in these public baths. This is post-war France, I imagine. And he would always try to peep into the woman's showers. And one day he does. And she sees him. Screams. So he hightails it out of there. I really like this guy's cartoony style. I mean, the backgrounds are so beautifully drawn realistically. But look at that face. That's pretty uh, abstracted. So it's just a little, uh, you know, vignette from this guy's life. Raw would always try to do this, always try to reprint some classic comic, either from comic strip history or comic book history. So they do a beautiful Basil Wolverton Powerhouse Pepper strip. And Powerhouse Pepper was this character Basil Wolverton created, published by Timely. He was pretty successful. He had his own title, a um, bunch of issues, and they were very surreal Um I think inadvertently so. I don't think Basil Wolverton was trying to blow anyone's mind. He was like this hardcore Christian dude. But he, what he thought was humor, now we look back at it and it's just like, man, this is weird. Like, this is surreal craziness. And this one's a perfect one. Because one day he's walking down the street and everyone he meets is like a fucking nightmare creature. Like something out of Hrana's Bosch. He gets in a fight with one of them, and one punch just <laughs> demolishes the guy. That's another thing about Powerhouse Pepper. He's inhumanly strong, superhumanly strong. And that's a part of the, his character. He's kind of dumb, but really light, but a sweet guy, even though he's kind of violent. So he sees more and more of these freaks. He's convinced that he's dreaming. He's like, this is a nightmare. I've got to wake up. And he does wake up, and then he sees more of these freaks. So he's like, I'm still dreaming. I got to do something. And he gets in another fight. 
and it turns out he's the strong man from the circus. His uh, friend informs him that, oh no, the circus is in town. The freaks are walking around. You've just been seeing the circus freaks. And so Powerhouse Pepper's relieved. Uh, once again, Ben, we get a Ben Catcher, a nice meaty long Ben Catcher strip. The smell on exterior street. And um, I don't even know how to describe Ben Catcher if you've never read him. Just the most idiosyncratic voice in comics, even outside of comics. He just, he doesn't really necessarily t tell stories. It's just these little observations of these strange neighborhoods, places. It's always about geography with him. He like, his comics will explore a certain piece of geography, usually just a few city streets. Um, his stuff's very urban, very urban. And uh, Ben Catcher's from New York City. And so they're just amazing. The, the His observations and the weird ideas he comes up with, like he just makes up these weird products and uh, weird, even ethnicities, <laughs> like these cultures. This one is about this landlord, this unnamed eth ethnic population has been moving into the city and they're very unique in their practices. And he starts getting fascinated by them and even goes undercover and pretends to be one of them so he can penetrate their inner circle and find out all their their strange ways. Oh, sorry. I keep forgetting to uh, show off everything. This is a... Uh, he doesn't really draw like this anymore, Ben Catcher. Like, this is like things are, you know, shaded better. His style got a little less um, illustrative. More just, you know, simple. But I kind of miss this Ben Catcher. When there's a nice blend of, like, really, like, kind of cartoony characters. But also, you know, shading and nice contrast between black and white. Yeah, you gotta read some Ben Catcher. I can't, I really, sorry, I'm a, not a good enough commentator to describe exactly why I love him so much. But he is definitely, at the very least, you'll come away thinking, wow, that's definitely a unique voice. <laughs> I find his stuff so entertaining. I've got most of his graphic novels. I need more of his stuff, though, because Ben Catcher wasn't in normal comic books, per se. He's, for years, almost all of his comics were, like, in newspapers in New York City, in, like, fancy magazines, slick magazines that had nothing to do with comics. He somehow, like, broke out of the comic book ghetto and was considered, even before graphic novels were considered cool, he had already infiltrated the non-comic world. Yeah, I think Pantheon published his first graphic novel. That might have been after Mouse, so... But it was, it was still pretty early. Because his name, he had a cachet to him that most comic artists didn't. He, I think he wrote an opera or a ballet. He's definitely like, he's never done fine art painting as far as I know, but he seems like he's in that world. That fancy pants, you know, not in the comic book ghetto. I like this guy. Look at what this life has done to me. The hair rubbed completely off the front of my thighs. Just all these weird little <laughs> observations and shit. Man, this is almost like a graphic novella. It's like 20-something pages of new Ben Catcher work. See how good Ra is? <laughs> I told you. And then we have a page, one pager from Edward Sorrell, the famous American cartoonist. This is another guy who was, like, always in, like, like, you know, the nation, the realist. He was in fancy magazines and newspapers. 
he was a a real cartoonish, you know. And this one's just called Fewer Chosen. <laughs> it's kind of funny how he's talking about how all these great actors and writers like John Updike, how they wanted to be cartoonists but failed, so they went to Hollywood or became writers. And Edward Sorrell is addressing the reader. And he says, it really take, cartooning really takes a special kind of talent. <laughs> like almost bragging, like, oh yeah, those guys just couldn't cut the mustard. So they had, to, they had to become actors and famous writers and millionaires. And we have an inside back cover by George Ann Dean. She's another artist. I think she was a fine artist who didn't do many comics. But I think I only know her from Raw. Maybe she was in a few other anthologies in the 90s. Uh, I can't remember. Kind of interesting, but eh, I don't know. And then a beautiful back cover by, by Charles Burns. And it's almost like he drew this just to uh, illustrate this quote from the Washington Post. Raw will rearrange your head. And we see this guy with a hole in his head and all of these amazing characters are coming out. Just crazy dream images and nightmare images. So there you have it, guys. And you know, I haven't read these in a while. I think they even get better from here on in, if my memory serves correctly. But I could be wrong about that. But man... So I'm, uh, I'm, this is the new, uh, you know, I did Epic Illustrated, I did Wasteland, now I'm doing this. I'm going to always, on my channel, every four to five episodes, or every four episodes, sorry, five episodes, whatever, continue my scholarly examination of the great anthologies of all time. Actually, some will be not so great. They're just interesting. <laughs> or they're interesting to me when I was 13. So uh, I hope you liked it. And there's only going to be two more of these, unfortunately. I only have... I'm not going to do the big ones. It's not like I'll ever get those other issues. I'm not a millionaire. Raw number one is probably $1,000 by now. It was like $150 when I was in college. But maybe one day I will do the giant ones. I'll get a better camera. And uh, it'll make it look better. But in the meantime, I'm just going to do these three small issues. Um... You know, these were in remainder bins forever. You still find them in, like, Goodwills. Because they meant a lot of them. I guess they didn't sell that well. People weren't ready for serious comics, you know, in America. But these are not that hard to find. And they're not that expensive when you do find them. Unless things have changed. Maybe now on the internet. But no matter what you pay for it, it's not enough. It's It's worth it. Seriously, this is, I mean... Yeah, I'd, if I didn't own this, I'd pay 50 bucks for this easy, and I'm cheap as fuck. But this, you must have this in your collection. This is just really one of the best comics ever made, I think. All the Raws are. And uh, hope you enjoyed it uh, one-tenth as much as I did. But uh, thanks for watching, and hopefully I'll see you here next time at the Hercules Penix Academy of Comic Book Studies.